I now have a Patreon. Stay at the end of the video for details. A small reptile peeps out of its burrow. Seeing nothing, it scurries out. Out of nowhere it is seized by sharp, jagged teeth. The little animal can struggle, but it was over when the jaws closed around it. The predator turns its head, scanning the horizon before feeding. It is one of the swiftest and most keen hunters in this barren landscape, but it itself is prey. Life is hard and death comes easy in the dry landscape of Pangaea. Welcome to this dinosaur profile on Coelophysis. It represented a massive leap in the evolution of theropod dinosaurs, but its entry into paleontology was not nearly so momentous. The first finds came from New Mexico. It was the early 1880s and the bone wars were raging. Dozens of parties funded by Othniel Charles Marsh or Edward Drinker Cope were roaming fossiliferous regions looking for fossils to either send back to Connecticut or Pennsylvania, depending on who was signing their checks. During the 1870s, Marsh had in his employ an enigmatic man by the name of David Baldwin. He had got a taste of the American outdoors when working as a packer in 1875, helping the Wheeler Survey in mapping the West. Later, he used his expertise to search for fossils. When I said David Baldwin was enigmatic, I meant it. There are no photographs that I've managed to find, and he had a habit of disappearing for months on end on his own and turning up with a sack filled with fossil bones. He normally stayed around New Mexico. Most fossil parties worked during the spring and summer when conditions were more favourable, but Baldwin worked in the winter as the snow would provide a sure supply of fresh water. By 1881, for reasons best known to himself, Baldwin had switched his allegiance and his supply of fossil finds to Cope. In February of that year, he was working around the hamlet of Abiquiu and found some fossils in a cliff beside the Charms River. He collected them and sent them, with a few other finds, to Cope. Along with the bag was a note. Contains Triassic or Jurassic bones, all small and tender. Those marked little bones are many of them almost microscopic. All in this sack found together in same place, about 400 feet below Gypsum Stratum, Rio Seco, Rio Arriba County, New Mexico. February 1881. No feet, no head, only one tooth. D. Baldwin, Abiquiu. This was what made Baldwin invaluable. It's one thing getting fossils, but it's another knowing exactly where they came from. How valuable the location is to a fossil find varies, but not knowing where a specimen came from can reduce what you can find out by 50% or more, particularly if you think there may be more pieces to find. It took Cope quite a while to get round to the sack of fossils, but when he did in 1887, he concluded that the collection of bones belonged to at least two individuals of two species. He recognised them as slim theropod dinosaur bones and created two new species for them under Marsh's Solurus genus, Bowery and Longicollis. We know that Bowery was named after George Bauer, a colleague of Marsh who Cope respected and specialised in Galapagos tortoises. Later in 1887, possibly thinking that these bones were too slender and delicate to belong to Solurus, Cope reclassified them as Tanistrophaeus bowery, Longicollis, and thought there was another species in the mix, Willistoni. Tanistrophaeus was a bizarre lizard from the early Triassic, when animals were evolving to fill niches after the great dying. But Cope reconsidered again in 1889, creating the new dinosaur genus, Coelophysis. The name, which is Greek for hollow form, was a reference to the light hollow vertebrae, Cope described the animal as being a theropod about the size of a greyhound, but could not go further without more material. Oliver Hay looked over Coelophysis in 1930 and found that Cope had not designated which species was to be the type of Coelophysis, and so picked C. Bowery, seemingly at random. Northwest of Abiquiu was Ghost Ranch, home of the modernist painter Georgia O'Keeffe. Knowing that the area was rich in Triassic fossils, Edwin Colbert, curator of the American Museum of Natural History, led an expedition across it in 1947. His assistant, George Whitaker, 
found some bones, and then skeletons, and then more, and more. What Whitaker had found was a massive graveyard of theropods, seemingly of one species. Colbert assigned these skeletons to Coelophysis shortly after, and later in 1964 to the type species Coelophysis bowery. It transpired that while Coelophysis bowery had been named the type species, a fossil had not been assigned as the type specimen. Colbert finally made the Coelophysis sacrum the type fossil in 1989. This graveyard is legendary. There have been numerous expeditions to extract blocks from the quarry, decades of excavating fossils from those blocks, and it's still going on today. At the time of writing, the most recent expedition was in 2020, and many fossils have yet to be examined and given more than a glance. Many of the fossil skeletons are articulated, and there may be as many as 1,000 individuals buried at this one site. Over the years, it's been referred to as the Ghost Ranch or Coelophysis Quarry, but from here I'm going to refer to it as the Whitaker Quarry, as there have since been found other Coelophysis quarries at Ghost Ranch. Hunt and Lucas threw a wrench into the identification of these dinosaurs as Coelophysis in 1991. They claimed that as the Whitaker Quarry is many miles away and younger than the area that Baldwin claimed the original fossils had come from, and that those fossils had no real diagnostic features for comparison, the name Coelophysis should be abandoned and created a new name, Rhea Arribosaurus Colberti. This would have displeased the New Mexico State Legislature, which had made Coelophysis the state fossil ten years previously. Despite the new species being named after him, Colbert decided to fight this. He gathered together a group of supporters and successfully petitioned the International Commission on Zoological Nomenclature to change the type specimen of Coelophysis from the bones found by Baldwin to those in the Whitaker Quarry. The specimens collected by Cope had a few potentially diagnostic features, while the Whitaker Quarry had full skeletons. All of Cope's species were folded into Coelophysis Bowery, exemplified by this now famous skeleton. This sorted out Colbert's decades of research referring to Coelophysis, in a similar manner as Allosaurus being named after the finds at Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry, but not everyone was thrilled. A group of Coelophysis researchers noted in 2009 that this was achieved through legislation rather than scientific consensus and the 2014 review concluded the saga of the name Coelophysis, from Silurus to Tanis Trophaeus to Coelophysis to Rhea Arribosaurus to Coelophysis again, is a confusing one. Interestingly, the type specimen of Cope's Coelophysis longicollis, now folded into C. Bowery, has something features that make it identical to vertebrae from the Whitaker Quarry. Maybe if Oliver Hay had chosen this as the type species in 1930, or Colbert had chosen this as a type specimen, all of this trouble since could have been avoided. An attempt to reimpose the coelophysis found by Baldwin was attempted in the late 90s, with a find of some fossil bones found around the area indicated in Baldwin's note. It was classified as a coelophysid, and called, presumptuously, Eucelophysis Baldwini, which can be translated as Baldwin's True Coelophysis. Karma came after the hubris to come up with something like that, as later several studies confirmed that Eucelophysis was a dinosauriform, not even a true dinosaur. Species in the Coelophysid family have been rather fluid. The two other species referred to as Coelophysis are C. rhodesiensis from Zimbabwe and C. caenticate from Arizona. Both are from the early Jurassic, have been called Syntarsus and Megapnosaurus, and their genus is still being argued. I'm therefore going to leave these out of the biology and talk mainly about the Triassic Coelophysis Bowery. Numerous bits and pieces have been found throughout New Mexico and some parts of Arizona, but I'm going to be focusing on the huge amounts of information from Ghost Ranch, and particularly the Whitaker Quarry. In discussing the size of Coelophysis, there are generally two types. One with longer neck and tail, and one with longer body and generally stockier. Both measured about 3 metres long, with the larger body type tending to be heavier. I will be discussing these two types later. To put Coelophysis in context, I have to talk about the Triassic. The world was very different, not only from today, but from the Jurassic and Cretaceous. The continents were joined into one supercontinent, Pangaea. This resulted in large swaths of land turned into desert, being so far away from the sea that they saw very little rain. There was one huge ocean, Panthalassa with no land masses to interrupt its flow. 
Large seas on the equator near large land masses produced monsoons today. This was supercharged in the Triassic, with evidence of massive storms unlike anything that we see today, and have been dubbed mega monsoons. While the equator was mostly arid, there were some oases, particularly around rivers. This is where the dinosaurs achieved their foothold. The Ishiguilasto formation in South America, home of Herrerasaurus, Eoraptor and Pisanosaurus, was convenient for these early dinosaurs. Probably being warm-blooded, they had plenty of food to fuel their high metabolism, and predators could hunt the cold-blooded reptiles at dawn and dusk, when they would be sluggish. The deserts were a different proposition. Food was scarce, and although the dinosaur's upright stance made walking more energy efficient than the more splay-legged reptiles and synapsids, they would need food and water to fuel that high metabolism. So there emerged Coelophysis. It was more slender than Herrerasaurus, with longer legs, tail and flexible neck. While Herrerasaurus's dinosaur status is dubious, the same is not true for Coelophysis. Whatever your definition of dinosaur, it ticks all the boxes for theropod. It is also the earliest dinosaur to have a furcular, or wishbone. Although it acts like a spring, storing energy when birds flap, the use, if any, in Coelophysis is unknown. Although it had four fingers on its hands, like Herrerasaurus, most advanced theropods have just three, the fourth finger was not functional, and the bones of it were probably buried in the flesh of the hand. By the late Triassic, it seems that downy feathers were a thing with dinosaurs. But was Coelophysis feathered? Well, no skin impressions of Coelophysis have been preserved, so we can't say for sure. A lot of people use phylogenetic bracketing, which I'll not get into here, but it looks at close relatives. But that is flawed for feathers. Woolly mammoths are very closely related to Asian elephants, in fact more closely than African elephants, but their environments called for different covering, and that is what they got. The switch between scales and feathers, once you've done the genetic work for the feathers, is surprisingly easy. If you don't believe me, look at the chicken. Chickens have scales covering their lower legs and feet, but with the switching on of a few genes, some breeds of chickens have turned those scales into full-fledged feathers. I know this is a pigeon, but you get my point. Tyrannosauroids show scales in warm climates and feathers in cold, adapting just as the elephants did. I don't see Coelophysis possessing downy covering in the Triassic tropics. Overheating would have been an issue, and that is a concern for any animal over 2 metres long with insulation, unless they live in a cold environment. I am willing to be proven wrong on this, but based on the data at the moment, I would say no fuzz. Coelophysis had a very distinctive long jaw that was full of recurved teeth, covered on both sides with serrations. The recurved teeth made sure that no small prey was getting out of those jaws once they were inside, and those serrations would continue to slice and cut as the prey struggled. In fact, Coelophysis had some of the most serrations on their teeth of any carnivorous dinosaur. The skull had very large openings to reduce the weight put upon that slender neck. Unusual for dinosaurs and most animals of the time, it also had two small ridges just in front of the eyes, possibly brightly coloured and used for display. This kind of ridge would develop in later theropods like Dilophosaurus to ridiculous proportions. The superb preservation of some of the Whitaker quarry coelophysis allowed for the scleretic rings to be reconstructed. This tells us some things about the animal's eyes. In birds, crocodiles and almost all living reptiles, the eyes fill the orbits. With the scleretic ring, we can tell the shape of the eyeballs. Most bird and reptile eyes are flat, like this eye of a swan. It provides a good sense of vision in daylight. Some have a deeper, globose eye, like this one of a hawk. These eyes are possessed by birds of prey, mainly falconiforms, and some predatory lizards. This large pupil and increased distance between the lens and the retina produce a larger image and more acute vision. With a slit pupil, lizards with this type of eye are also able to hunt in low light. Falconiforms tend to have an asymmetrical sclerotic ring, being heavier at the front, possibly to aid in focusing on prey. The third type are tubular. This is the eye of an owl. Owls are the only animals that have this type of eye, sacrificing clarity for night vision. Each one of these has a very distinctive sclerotic ring. The dimensions of Coelophysis' sclerotic rings were plotted against those of various rings of extant birds and reptiles, and it fell within the range of the globose falconiform eyes. 
detailed vision attuned to pick out prey from a distance and track it. The bones of the ring almost completely match those of Harris hawks. It may be coincidence, but Harris hawks evolved to hunt in sparse arid environments, and with their unusually long legs, have been known to chase prey on foot. Coelophysis eyes were not suited for night vision though. Their pupils would have been too small, giving it poorer night vision than most falconiforms. It was not a night hunter, and so would probably have possessed round pupils, rather than the slit pupils of nocturnal predators. Again, in binocular vision, Coelophysis is consistent with hawks and eagles. This would have sacrificed range of vision for pinpoint accuracy in determining distance. This is not to be dismissed as Coelophysis was not at the top of the food chain and had many predators. Being able to spy prey with accurate depth perception seemed more important than spotting a predator. Having large globose eyes meant that Coelophysis's range of eye movement was limited. Many birds can scarcely move their eyes at all, they move their heads instead. This would have been helped by the long, flexible neck. The head would have been able to move in a very bird-like manner, able to track a target and stabilise its gaze. That's how Coelophysis could see. But how did it move? Like all dinosaurs, Coelophysis walked upright. The tops of the femurs pointed inwards, allowing Coelophysis to stand taller than sprawling lizards. This meant that walking, especially long distances, was easier for dinosaurs, and Coelophysis' air sacs, indicated by its hollow bones, would have given it phenomenal endurance. A 2020 study called How to Build a Dinosaur attempted to create a full computer model of a dinosaur to run virtual mechanical tests on. The model was based on Coelophysis, due to the huge amount of almost complete skeletons at the Whitaker Quarry. Coelophysis' speed was calculated to be between 5 and 9.5 miles per hour, about as fast as a human. Fossilised footprints judged as belonging to Coelophysis indicate that it usually walked to conserve energy. But it could certainly run. As an animal grows, their thigh bones get proportionally thicker to handle the increased weight. Coelophysis' thighs grew much thicker. The only mammal that matches Coelophysis' proportional bone thickening is the antelope which have to deal with increased weight and forces produced by increased speed. For a relatively small animal, Coelophysis had a lot of force going through those legs. The virtual model showed that this force centred on the ankle, biomechanically the weak point in human and bird legs, which were used for comparison by the How to Build a Dinosaur study. Coelophysis, though, had a simple hinge joint in its ankle. This made it less manoeuvrable, but allowed it to cope with these stresses, making the ankle a strong point rather than a weakness. This was a dinosaur that sacrificed manoeuvrability for speed. In 1978, Coombs came up with a set of characteristics possessed by fast runners. Let's see how Coelophysis measures up. Relatively long limbs? Check. Hinge-like joints? In the foot and in the ankle? Check. Short, strong upper leg? Check. Long, thin lower leg? And long foot bones too? Check. Symmetrical foot? Large central toe and a shorter one on either side? Digit 5 would not have touched the ground. Check. Digitigrade stance, meaning walking on the toes rather than the whole foot. Check. Fused foot bones. Check. Reduced toes on the edge of the feet. Digits 2 and 4 were smaller, digit 5 was off the ground, and digit 1 was almost gone. Check. And these are specific for bipeds. Small arms. Check. One bone in the lower leg. Well, although the fibula is still there, it is reduced, leaving the tibia to carry over 95% of the weight. So, I'm going to give that a check. And that is all of them. The design of Coelophysis, the eyes and speed, suggests that it was basically a falcon on legs. It would spy prey from a long way off and then sprint at it, using its eyes to track it and catch it in its jaws. The arms, though reduced for speed, were good for grasping and clutching. Not having as much reach as the mouth, they could probably grab food to carry or help manipulate it. So what was it catching? There were many small reptiles, particularly drapanosaurs, living in trees and burrows. Maybe some reptile-like mammals or small pseudosuchians. I'll get into some of the neighbours later, but it is hard to tell how to classify some Triassic animals. In the Whitaker Quarry, there were what looked like the remains of fish scales in a Coelophysis coprolite, fossilised faeces. But there have also been claims of something else baby Coelophysis in the guts of adults. Cannibalism. There were two Coelophysis cannibals identified by Colbert at the Whitaker Quarry, 
but I'm going to have to pin down our definitions of cannibalism a bit. The definition of cannibalism is, of course, a creature eating a member of the same species. But there are different levels based on cannibalistic behaviour. After trying and failing to find any literature defining these differences, I have created my own levelling system. Let me know in the comments if you know of any studies that I've missed. Level 1 is a waste not want not behaviour, finding a dead member of the same species and chowing down. In severe cases there is actually killing beforehand, but the purpose is apart from feeding. When lions take over a pride, they kill the cubs of the previous lion, and sometimes eat them too. In colonial birds and birds of prey, runts can sometimes be killed by their siblings, so they do not have to share food. The chick is then sometimes eaten as well. In fossils, this is as far as we can go. There is evidence of Tyrannosaurs and Majungasaurus possibly killing members of their own species, maybe in disputes, and then eating them. Then there is level 2, which I call active cannibalism, where the animal hunts members of its own species for food. This is well documented in crocodiles and alligators, where adults hunting juveniles is a control on population. In the United States, an alligator cull went horribly wrong when all the adults were shot, and a whole lot of juveniles had no predators. The alligator population exploded. Finally, there is level 3, infanticide cannibalism. This is understandably rare, as having young takes a lot of time and resources. Turning around and eating them is a bit counterproductive, but it does happen. I can't speak for invertebrates, but there is an example of a tetrapod that does this. The Komodo dragon. After 7-8 to eight months of guarding the nest from predators and rival mothers who want a pre-made nest, the starving mother's maternal instincts break the second she hears the hatchlings coming out of their eggs. Sometimes the hatchlings stay in the nest for hours before emerging. If they're too quick, they can find a very hungry Komodo dragon outside. Colbert thought that he had found evidence of at least level 1 that Coelophysis ate baby Coelophysis. He theorised that there being at least two examples indicated that this was at least level 2, active cannibalism. Some popular literature ran with the Coelophysis ate its own babies, pushing it to level 3, misunderstanding that all Colbert said was that the babies were members of the same species. I have always been sceptical of these Coelophysis cannibals. I can't put my finger on why, but they never convinced me. Sterling Nesbitt seemed to think the same. He gathered together a group of colleagues to actually check out these cannibals. Despite some opposition in 2002, no one had really looked at the fossils since Colbert made the cannibalism claim in 1989. In 2006, Nesbitt and his team devised two criteria for cannibalism. The remains must be shown to reside in the abdominal cavity and come from the same taxon. Easy enough. In the first case, there was a mess of bones, supposedly in the gut, and one articulated leg. The leg was the only bit identifiable as belonging to a coelophysis, and it was 62% the size of an adult leg. A coelophysis eating this whole seems unlikely. The 2002 study that doubted the cannibalism claim looked at this specimen and found that while the left ribs surround the bones, the right ones are bent away. It seems that the coelophysis' belly was opened and either was deposited onto these remains or they were washed inside. The opening could have been created by being cut by something or bursting after post-mortem bloating. It happens. Not a cannibal as these were not contained in the abdominal cavity. So what about the other cannibal, the type specimen? Well the purported gut contents, shown here in yellow, appear to lie between the ribs, blue and red, and within the gastralia or belly ribs, shown in green. It shows that there was no exploding coelophysis here and the bones are exactly where the gut should be. So far, so good. Well, Nesbitt's team looked at the bones and found no diagnostic features of coelophysis. They weren't from a theropod. They weren't even from a dinosaur. Doing a little more analysis, they found that the bones matched Hesperosuchus, a small crocodilomorph. So criterion 2 was not met. The abdominal contents weren't of the same taxon. They state, our results show that although stomach contents were remarkably preserved in situ in ghost ranch coelophysis, no evidence for cannibalism exists. In 2005, coelophysis coprolites, just under the tails of skeletons, were examined. There were also some instances of collolites. These are pieces of faeces that were still in the colon. There is a name for fossilised unevacuated poo, but I have to make up cannibalistic tears for myself. There were found bone fragments, but none could be positively identified as belonging to coelophysis. Shortly after Nesbitt's team's study, 
Preparation on a skeleton revealed what looked like fossilised vomit lying by a coelophysis mouth, a regurgitolith. It contained larger bone fragments than the coprolites, and some looked like the skull bones of a small coelophysis. This seems to be confirmed by the presence of tiny teeth. No other animal has those sharply recurved teeth with that many serrations. So most of the coelophysis cannibals appear to have been cleared, but there are still signs that coelophysis was at least willing to resort to a waste-not-want-not mentality when times got hard. About 70 specimens of coelophysis from the Whitaker Quarry were used for a population analysis. The results were not all that surprising. A high infant mortality slowing as the animal grew. They probably reached sexual maturity between the ages of 2 and 3. What's notable is that the curve never levels off. Coelophysis were always at risk of dying of something. There is also the very low mortality for the first six months or so. There may have been a benefit to being small, maybe being able to use other creatures' burrows, but that would hardly explain the sharp drop afterwards. The explanation that seems most likely is parental care. This length of care and success against infant mortality might have made coelophysis rather unusual around all of the Pseudosuchians of the Triassic, also negating the accusation of coelophysis as an infanticidal cannibal. No eggs of coelophysis have been found, either laid or inside oviducts. Comparisons with birds and reptiles suggest that coelophysis was more on the reptile side of things, laying more, smaller eggs. Judging by the creature's size, an egg would have weighed about 32 to 40 grams, about the weight of an apricot. Each egg would have been anywhere from 3.1 to 6.1 centimetres across. One of the signs towards reptiles is that a comparative bird size egg would not have been able to pass through a coelophysis oviduct. Calculations put a clutch at 24 to 26 eggs. This lines up with the population study, being a good replacement number to keep the population stable. By the time coelophysis was one year old, the differences in the gracile and robust forms was visible. Both, though, had long tails, large feet, but very short, high skulls. By two, coelophysis would have grown into its adult proportions, and got bigger at four, and achieved its maximum size at around seven. Compared with each other, proportionally the necks, tails and legs shrank slightly, while the body, arms, and particularly the skull, grew longer. There has been a lot of study regarding the two apparent body types of coelophysis. Since they were identified, this has been seen as evidence of sexual dimorphism, a difference between male and female. Gregory S. Paul came up with the names Gracile and Robust. You saw lights coming up with names for things. But 2009 study preferred long and short, as the overall size was very similar, and relative lengths made up the difference. This was not made clear in Paul's names. The long form is thought to be the female, not only because the larger body form is generally assumed to be male, but because the sacrum is unfused, which would make it easier for egg laying. A 2016 study took another look, however. They thought that previous work, where the specimens are assigned an age based on the femur size, and then split into two forms, was rather simplistic. Joined by Sterling Nesbitt, Christopher Griffin came up with 27 characteristics that were presumed to show maturation, becoming generally more common in larger sizes, but not exclusively. The plotting showed that as the coelophysis grew, its development could go down several different paths. That affected its body size and parts of its development. This was done with the possible coelophysis Megapensaurus rhodesiensis II, with the similar result of massive variation in development and size. While this has been remarked upon in the early prosauropod Platyosaurus, there are relatively few other early theropods to test this on. It's also complicated by the fact that birds have very little opportunity for variation as they reach full size within one year, and reptilian archosaurs, like alligators, have a slower metabolism, resulting in any variation only being notable in later life. If it holds up, this research could point to early dinosaurs being extremely adaptable to their environment, their size altering with their diet and conditions to help them survive. Increasing the variety also allows natural selection to be more picky, making a species development faster. The wealth of skeletons at the Whitaker Quarry has led to a great deal of speculation. Unlike many accumulations, this looks like one event. It seems as though all of these animals were caught out in a massive flash flood, and were certainly buried by one. Evidence of 26 of the possible M. rhodesiensis in Zimbabwe, where Griffin and Nesbitt got their material, and several more in South Africa, 
point to this not being uncommon where these kinds of animals lived. Ghost Ranch during the Triassic was near an ephemeral river called the Chin Lei River, part of a huge ancient river system. The key mystery is why so many individuals were together at the same time. Some do theorise that Coelophysis lived in flocks, but I don't think so. Coelophysis anatomy focused on small alert prey, animals that could be held in the mouth or grabbed in the hands. Not some large prey that only a great number could take down. I also find it difficult to imagine the Triassic wilderness being able to sustain a flock that would act like carnivorous locusts, devouring any small synapsid or reptile they passed by. There are two main reasons put forward as to why so many predators would gather together at one time and place. Seasonal food source, or reproductive activity. It was thought that the fossilised fish represented the former, like a salmon run in Alaska, but there was no sign of migration or spawning features in any of the fish. So what about reproductive activity? While the majority of the specimens were within the theorised sexual maturity age range, some of the youngest were about one year old, indicating it had been about a year since they had hatched. Although there were enough data points to plot the population curve, there were no hatchlings and no eggs anywhere, not even in the bodies of any coelophysis, indicating that they had not passed the point of fertilisation. For a seasonal large gathering of coelophysis, a reliable source of water would have been appropriate. As any host will tell you, for a large group, you need to be sure that you've got something for everyone to drink. So many coelophysis had turned up for this meeting that during an excavation between 1947 and 1948, Colbert wrapped several blocks in plastic jackets, slapped the name coelophysis on them after a cursory examination, and sent them to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. There they stayed until Sterling Nesbitt came along in 2006, then working for his PhD. He opened one of these jackets and realised that the animal inside was not a coelophysis. It had a beak for a start. Its ankles were not the simple hinge of coelophysis, but more complex, and the final proof was the hips. This animal would have stood upright, but not by having the tops of the legs turned in, but by having a shelf of bone turn the legs down. It was not a dinosaur, but a crocodilian. It was named Ephigia, meaning ghost, as it was found in Ghost Ranch, and O'Keefe after the Ghost Ranch artist Georgia O'Keefe. The animal's skull was very similar to that of Shuvasaurus, a skull and some vertebrae that had been discovered in Triassic rocks in Texas in 1993. Its appearance and possession of a beak led to theorising that it was the first ornithomimid, the ostrich mimic dinosaurs so far only known from the late Cretaceous. The similarities allowed Shuvasaurus to be identified as a crocodilian itself, although there is still debate whether Shuvasaurus and Ophidia should be separate genera, since the similar skull are the only parts that are comparable. These animals, with their long legs, long tails and long heads, are an example of convergent evolution, where two animals independently adapt the same way to solve the same problems. Cephalopods evolved eyes independently from us. They're almost the same, just wired differently. For a more relevant example, fish, ichthyosaurs and dolphins all develop the same streamlined shape individually, as the best for moving through water. Being a long-legged, bipedal, slim, long-necked animal was advantageous in this world. An upright stance made traversing long distances easier, and there are signs that these early crocodilians may have had a high metabolism too. The tropics where Coelophysis lived were not complete deserts, but highly seasonal, maybe enjoying a few months of wet and then being mostly arid for the rest of the year. Pinning down a date for Coelophysis is difficult. If we leave out the possible Coelophysis from the Jurassic, you get a range of around 212 million years ago. You can get more accurate ages from the differences in trace fossils, ammonites and conodonts in the Triassic, none of which can be found in the Whitaker Quarry and other places inland where Coelophysis lived. So dates are a bit vague. The large body of water where the Whitaker Quarry is now was home to a lot of fish. There were coelacanths and other lobe fin fishes like Chinlea. There were also large lungfish like Arganidus. These were becoming more numerous in land as droughts were common and lungfish can cocoon themselves and go into a kind of stasis until water returns. There were also large amphibians, like Apachisaurus and Coscinonodon. These were large ambush predators, but these amphibians were on the way out. The presence of these animals indicate that the body of water was reliable, possibly a large oxbow lake formed by the ephemeral river, as these large amphibians would have dried out without it. 
Around the same time in Portugal, there's evidence of an amphibian graveyard. It seems as a body of water was drying up, they were brought closer and closer together. Eventually they died as the water disappeared. Archosauroforms became widespread after the PT mass extinction, and they were in the water too. Van Clevia was a sharp-toothed amphibious carnivore. Although it had to breathe air, like aquatic mammals today, it lived in the water. It had osteoderms all over its body, giving it a crocodile-like hide that retained moisture, far better than the amphibians during a drought. Also you have the Coelophysis mimics, Shuvasaurus and Ophigia. There are also other, less common Saurisian dinosaurs, Chindosaurus, which is currently regarded as a theropod, and Demonosaurus, another possible early theropod. The whole dinosaur could have been between 1.5 to 2.2 metres long, as only bits and pieces have been found, including a skull with huge teeth. I call these Coelophysis mimics in the same way that Ornithomimids are called bird mimics, despite evolving before modern flightless birds. The similar body shape evolved independently as the best suited to this environment, although not all of them were predators. Ephigia has signs of being herbivorous, and some theropod-looking dinosaurs show sign of being omnivores. But what did these carnivores eat? There were many remains of reptiles, various teeth and assorted small bones. The crocodilomorph Hesperosuchus would have been a common prey animal, as evidence from parts being found in a Coelophysis stomach. There was also the little Revueltosaurus, a little herbivorous crocodilian. There were other herbivores around that wouldn't have been on Coelophysis' menu. There was the large Placerias. This was a type of non-mammalian synapsid. Synapsids were a diverse group in the Permian, and some still survived in the Triassic, but they were on their way out. Mammals are the only living synapsids today. Adult Placerias would have been too large for Coelophysis, which was suited to small, agile prey. There were two types of Aetosaurs, Tipothorax and Desmatosuchus. These armoured and spiked crocodilians would have been able to ward off pesky predators like Coelophysis. Aetosaurs might have resembled Ankylosaurs, but those dinosaurs were not the first to develop bony armour, and they would not be the last. But Coelophysis was not the top predator. The Aetosaurs needed that armour to protect against something. And that was the Rausukids. One of the largest was Postosuchus. In 2013, a study reported that the skeleton of Postosuchus was built for walking on two legs, making it look more like one of the later dinosaurs. In the Hayden Quarry, also at Ghost Ranch, a large Rausukian jaw was uncovered. It was found to be a new animal in 2016. As only the jaw was found, based on other Rausukians, it could have been anywhere from 3.5 metres long to 5 metres long. It was named Viveron, after a mythical 10 metre long rattlesnake spirit said to haunt the canyons of Ghost Ranch. But these Rausukians were not the largest predators in the area. They were the phytosaurs. These may have looked like crocodiles, but they were not crocodilians, or even true archosaurs. They were archosauroforms, like Van Clevia. Dinosaurs and their bird descendants are more closely related to crocodiles than these were. Another instance of convergent evolution in the mad world of the Triassic. The phytosaur found in the Whitaker Quarry was a huge Redondosaurus, common in the Triassic waterways of North America. These would have roamed the rivers like modern crocodiles, feeding on animals that ventured too close to the water. So Coelophysis was not just battling against the harsh environment, but against these big, dangerous Rausukians. They had an upright stance too, allowing them to efficiently traverse the arid environment. Looking at modern crocodiles, they may have had other advantages as well. Having a high metabolism made Coelophysis fast and agile, but it needed to feed that activity with food and water. Crocodiles have a lower metabolism, and so large crocs can subsist on two good meals a year, sometimes going two years without any food at all, and even weeks without fresh water. This ability would have been a godsend in the Triassic. There are signs, however, that at least some of these crocodilians might have had a high metabolism instead. Their posture and signs of an efficient four-chambered heart lead some to think that they led a more active lifestyle. Going back to the warm-blooded, cold-blooded split in my Brachiosaurus video, this by no means meant that they became wholly warm-blooded, but it would have increased their need for food and water. While Coelophysis and the crocodilians were competing in the Triassic, by the Jurassic, the Coelophysoids were left standing, 
It's not fully understood why the dinosaurs won out, as the crocodilians were all over the place. It might have been something in the dinosaurs' lifestyle. Fast growing, high metabolism. Although if Rausukians had similar features, this muddies things somewhat. One possibility growing in popularity is the increased variation described by Nesbitt and Griffin. This increased ability to adapt to the environment might have given dinosaurs the edge through the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction. I also think that the possibility of parental care should not be discounted. The apparent ability of coelophyses to look after their young and decrease their mortality when they were vulnerable might have also helped their population numbers through hardships. It's difficult to tell how widespread this possible behaviour might have been among early dinosaurs, but it is intriguing. Possibly Coelophysis' greatest impact was how it managed to open the arid interior of Pangaea to dinosaurs. Its body plan worked in the harsh environment. Several million years earlier in the Ishigualasto formation, Eoraptor had some non-carnivorous teeth, showing the earliest signs of omnivory in dinosaurs. Coelophysis' neighbour, Chindosaurus, might have been similar. While recent analyses have placed it as a theropod, it was originally classified as an early sauropodomorph, and this is all based off a few body fossils and no skull. More finds could reveal a sauropod relative in this environment. One of the earliest sauropodomorphs was Pantidraco, discovered in Wales and named after the place where it was found, that I won't attempt to pronounce. Europe at the time was covered in wetlands, rivers, and, like portions of South America, offered an oasis and a place where they could grow and thrive. Dinosaurs like Pantidraco had used the form of animals like Coelophysis to cross the arid land and reach new environments. This helped dinosaurs spread across the world during the Triassic. When the continents began to split, they were already everywhere. Animals like Coelophysis made dinosaurs global. A great step forward in early dinosaur evolution, and thanks to mass tragedy, one of the best known dinosaurs ever discovered. Coelophysis was a pioneer, enabling this group of animals worldwide dominance. Honestly thought this was going to be short. Shows what you can find when you look into something. A request for the usual things, like, subscribe, and share with anyone who might find this interesting, as it seems I upload too infrequently for YouTube to push these videos. As I said at the beginning of the video, I now have a Patreon. Species tier patrons will have access to early releases of my videos and your name at the end of the credits, while genus tier patrons will also get access to the history section of my videos as soon as I've put it together and a shout out at the end of the videos. You will also be able to help towards the goals, the first of which is a special video on the Bone Wars, and all proceeds will go towards getting access to more papers and studies going back into these videos. Link in the description. Despite my fervent wish to cover all my bases, I have another correction. In my Iguandon video when talking about the dinosaur mummies, Leonardo with the scales and crop preserved, this was actually a Brachylophosaurus, not an Edmontosaurus. I got it confused with an Edmontosaurus mummy creatively called Duckbill. So this is a Brachylophosaurus, and this... This animal had a big ass. ...is an Edmontosaurus. Next. Europe had the deer, the American plains had the bison, and the Serengeti have the wildebeest. 150 million years ago. The fern savannah of western Laurasia had Camarasaurus. Hope to see you then.